Welcome to the Fishing Coach Show. Today we interviewed Rabbi Dove Bear Cohen. He has an amazing story. He spent six years in the, in the Far East. He was, a, he was a Buddhist and fasting for upwards of 10 days many, many times. And his story is so mind-blowing. What do you think about him? Yeah, this was one of the most fascinating stories that we've, that we've had on our show. Yeah. He has been through so many different experiences, and his worldview is such a complete per- picture yeah. of what it takes to, to master yourself. Yes. He has a book uh, called, called Ma- Mastering Life, and his self-mastery is amazing. He really gets into the, the purpose and the meaning of life and getting to the, the body-soul relationship and that we're really, we are souls. We have bodies, and I'm, you're really going to enjoy this one. This is the Fish and Coach Show. Welcome to special guest Rabbi Dove Bear Cohen. Thank you, Brandon. Great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to start off just by developing and hearing your story, giving you a chance to tell your story. It is, of course, outlined in this great book, Mastering Life. Um, but for those who haven't had the chance to read your book yet, let's give them a little preview. What, what led to your, how did your journey begin? Great question. I grew up in England, and I played lots of sport, rugby and football, <laughs> soccer, and I was very active, but then it came to a point in my teenage years, which is very difficult. It's very difficult mm-hmm. trying to build a sense of self. Yes. And especially in England, and you've got to try and be cool, and, and boys don't have emotions, and, you, and it's very yeah. difficult to build a real sense of self. Right. Um, so I became a DJ, a dance music DJ, yeah. hard house and drum and bass. Uh-huh. And I played in some clubs, and I, I got very much into the music scene. Yeah. And it was great. It, it helped me uh, experience higher states of consciousness, mm-hmm. um, which I did then in Asia in more healthy ways. <laughs> right. I say that. But I, <laughs> I ended up going to Manchester University and I studied philosophy, oh. which is a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> really waste. Actually, it's not. Now it's not. Now that I'm actually thinking about life, right. it's not a waste of time. But at the time, it was what can I just do without doing anything to get a degree uh-huh. basically Great. so school. that's what i did and have the college experience i actually had a horrible time oh. it was i had a wonderful childhood my parents were amazing and loving and supportive and i sport and music and everything mm-hmm. when i got to college i had a bit of a crash because i just realized how meaningless everything was mm-hmm. i actually started asking people a question i did a, almost like a dissertation on it how are you top five answers can't complain, getting by, not too bad, <laughs> hanging in there, yeah. could be worse. Yeah. Oh, man. And I was like, that's all. No, not too bad means I'm bad, just not too bad. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. general stock questions that everyone answers. At oh. the time, what we did you come up with as the best answer? I was like, I was one of those, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. They could have, I, wanted, I wanted my answer to, beli- to be unbelievable. Thank you. Mm. I'm living with immense vitality and purpose. <laughs> I know right. what I'm here for. I, I have a sense of self. I am in control of myself and, and my mind and my emotions. And mm-hmm. so really, f- for the first two years, I, I wouldn't say I was ever really depressed, mm-hmm. but I was definitely having some kind of existential crisis. And I was like, this can't be what life's all about. No one's happy. No mm-hmm. one's living with meaning. And but my, my, my question is, is, most people, when they're in college, they're not really worried about life and their purpose and meaning. They're worried about, like, what's the next keg party they're going to go to? Maybe when they're majoring in philosophy. Well, but okay, maybe it's different for philosophy majors. I was in the yeah. business major department, so, like, <coughs> people just wonder what a keg party is. <laughs> like, what got you to start thinking to yourself, like, what is, there's got to be more than life than just, than just what, I, what I've experienced? You know what? I think it was two things. Firstly, Bruce Lee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was the actor, right? Yeah, I yeah. watched lots of martial arts films, and I realized that I'd never learned any life skills. Growing up in my, with my education, I had a very good English education, mm-hmm. but no one ever said to me when I was 11 years old, you know what, 11-year-old boy, you're going to face disappointment in your life, and here are three top things you can do to deal with disappointment, how, c- how you can process your emotions, or you know, you're going to have to build a sense of self, and this is what it should be based on. Here are good... Va- I learned nothing, so I had no life skills. And Bruce Lee started saying some meaningful things. He said, don't pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. Oh, wow. Oh, that's good. I was like, I hear that, Bruce. That makes sense to me. So yeah. I got very into martial arts, and I started training uh, in karate and tai chi. And in then college. I In college. And then I started looking into Eastern philosophy yeah, based on that. Sure. And suddenly I became alive. 
I just sat in the library for hours. You couldn't get me anywhere near the library for two years. <laughs> yeah. Sat in the library for hours reading all these Buddhist texts and mystical, Hindu mystical things. And I've suddenly found some depth of reality. Like, what is life really about? Wow. What, the meaning and purpose, which I never found in Judaism. Grew up with a very strong Jewish identity. Um, I had a bar mitzvah I didn't put on to fill in, but right. um, I played for a Jewish football team, soccer team. So I had a very strong Jewish identity. Even Friday night dinners we had with my parents. My parents are South African, so they were traditional. So we, I used to have Friday night dinner, yeah. and we lit candles and made kiddush and had challah, and then I'd go clubbing afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I always had a strong Jewish identity, but I never saw Judaism as an actual path to spiritual enlightenment. It was just a ritualistic tradition that has some nice things like candles on Hanukkah and but it didn't it didn't have meaning but suddenly in these eastern traditions I found immense understanding of life did your parents instill any love of Israel or a Zionistic were they were they was that part of your Judaism to some up? extent I was part of Habanim Draw which is a Zionist youth movement okay so I came to Israel uh, for three months I worked on a kibbutz oh okay and so was I, during after college or before college. Okay. After school, before college, I came for three months. I also represented Great Britain in the Maccabi Games. Oh, the Maccabi we Games. just had the Maccabi Games here. Oh, yeah. What, what exactly. sport? And, and Table tennis. Oh, oh wow. wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I could have gone for tennis, but I got offered table tennis first, so my dad just said, take table tennis. Yeah. And it was, it was great. So I definitely had uh, some connection with Israel. Yeah. But not as a holy land, not right. as a spiritual place. It was just a place that Jesus went to. Yeah. Yeah. So then you started looking into the Western faith, specifically Hinduism and Buddhism? The Eastern, yeah. Oh, so Eastern, right. Totally different. <laughs> yes, I looked into Hinduism, Buddhism mainly. Right. I was very attracted by the Buddhist ideas. And I realized very early on, I started meditating in the, my third year of college as well. Mm -hmm. I realized, which is still the most important thing anyone could ever hear, I believe, that your whole experience of existence, your whole experience of life is completely dictated by what's going on in your mind. Yeah. Your thoughts create your reality. reality. That's Correct. it. If you're having non-judgmental, compassionate, sweet, positive, uplifting thoughts, you'll have a good life. And if you don't, you won't. That's, that's the whole of the game here. Wow. So I realized that my friends and I, and even more nowadays with all the social media and everything, people are escaping the voice in their head. You have a voice in your from the second you wake up to the second you go to sleep, you have a voice in your head. In fact, you have five voices in your head. You have your father's critical voice, <laughs> yeah, and you have your ex-girlfriend's <laughs> voice about that, and you've got your, I, I, I got to get out of bed early, and the ones, no, stay wow. in bed. You've got this whole world in your head. So what most people do is try to escape. Yeah. Drugs, Netflix, parties, yeah, work. You don't, you don't think for yourself. When you watch TV, it's just there's no thinking. That's why they do it, though. Okay, I need to distract myself from that voice. But the problem with drugs and Netflix and things like that is once the drug wears off and the program's finished, then you're back to square one. You didn't yeah. improve yourself. Right. So it was very, very, very clear to me at some point that I have to learn to calm, clear, and control my mind. That was very clear. That is the key. It says in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, Ezehu Gibor, who is a strong one, a Koveshit Yitzro, the person who learns to deal with their internal world. And that's what Buddhism was teaching, and that's what these traditions are teaching. Turn inside. Our whole society is completely externally focused. People get their happiness based on things going their way. If things go my way. If my team wins, I feel happy. If the girl writes to me, I feel happy. Got the good job, good body. If things go my way, if it's sunny, I'm happy. Rainy, I'm sad. I get the bus, I'm happy. Miss the bus, I'm sad. If things meet up my, to my expectations, I'll be happy. That's why no one's ever happy. Because <laughs> you can't control those <laughs> no, things. You can't. And even if you get the car of your dreams, it's not going to make you a happier person. There's a better car next year. Yeah. <laughs> and someone's going to scratch your car yeah. or get a different car. But even if there's no better car ever, you're still not going to be a happier person by having <laughs> a car. You'll feel a bit good for a few days. That doesn't create happy. The key to happiness has got nothing to do with the external world. Mm. So too with self-esteem. The biggest issue facing mankind today, I really believe, is no sense of self-worth. Yeah. Nothing. 18-year-old secular person, 50-year-old religious person, it's all the same. I get my sense of self based on what you think of me. Yeah. External recognition, usually based on superficial values. Yeah. What my body looks like, what car I got. Even, and when you get older, what school my kids go to, yeah. and what job my son has. Yeah. And, 
is very, very, it, it, very sad. It's been ingrained more into us with social media too. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they're no, I, they're no real people anymore. No. People are Facebook profiles yeah. or Instagram accounts. Yeah. There's a, or TikTok. No, there's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so there's always That's anyone. Amazing. Wow. So did that lead to a sense of depression in some ways? Actually, no. I got very excited. Oh, <laughs> okay, good. I think I was always. I was just it, that. I, it's because of my parents. Uh-huh. I had such a loving, supportive childhood that I could just go on my journey. Yeah. Right. I had I had such a safe, loving base to go back to that I could go. Yeah. So I got very, I suddenly, I was like, wow, this is amazing. There's an answer. Yeah. I can do something. I don't have, I'm not doomed to just being in the rat race. I can do something about it. So what'd you do? I went for six years. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go and live in Southeast Asia. Yeah. What's the plan for good? Six years. The plan, the plan was, was six years? You know what? The plan was seven years. Oh. There's a movie. It's not a great one. Brad <laughs> Pitt, Seven Years in Tibet. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen it now. Uh, but anyway, so I got this idea, Tibet, seven yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to go for seven years. The movie and titles are a great way to make life decisions. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun that you you're influenced by a movie. 100%. I know, my whole life by Bruce Lee and Rocky and wow. Karate Kid. So, so fighting was always a huge part of this. Yeah. And this I just saw that the Eastern philosophies had everything I needed, physical, mental, spiritual, mastery, self-mastery. Which is the key, and I, I'm very excited. I'm going to go and do that. Right. I don't care. I don't. I just. I'm just not buying into that rat race. I just can't do it. I'm not going to be sitting in an office. So I'm just going to go and work out what life's about. My grandfather died when he was 100, and he said wow. before he died, "You don't want to live an I should have life." Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? He goes, "When you get to 90, you don't have so much to look forward to, so you look back." Yeah. I really should have traveled more. I should have spent more time with my kids, less time at work. I should right. have worked out the purpose of life. So it's like that makes sense. So he said to me, you can live your life from this age that when you get to 90, you're not regretting your life. You're thinking, I actually lived an amazing life. And yeah. don't let fear of failure stand. Yeah. For me, it was more of a failure not to do something. Right. <laughs> so wow. I, like, I don't care failing because at least I'm in a, an enchanted world of curious exploration of the adventure of life. Yeah. You live with the end game in mind. Love that. As I always say, you live with the end game. It's like, what do I want people to say when I'm like, I want to make sure I have no regrets. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I lived with the end game in mind. Yeah. And I always it very important. People often come to me and they're very nervous about decisions in life. Should I go to college? Should I come to yeshiva? Should I try this? I, and I always say to them, just calm down. <laughs> Make your decisions, <laughs> but just chill out. Why are you getting so... Some girl came in, should I be a preschool teacher or a nurse? Or I, don't? I said, well, that's good. <laughs> Either is... They're pretty good. Yeah. What uh-huh. do you feel more connected to? Like, yeah. But people are so uptight. And stressed, and yeah. I was just like, it's an adventure. Yeah. Go and choose, especially us. We're very privileged. So we mm-hmm. can really choose. I said to our students the other day, if you wanted to be a lawyer in Italy, you could. You just could. If you wanted to be a surf instructor in Hawaii, you, you could do anything. It would yeah. take many, many years. You'd have to learn Italian, go to law. But you could mm-hmm. do anything you like. So f- find it an amazing adventure. Life is an amazing, joyful adventure. So that's why I was like, great, let's go. <laughs> okay, wow. You, did you travel light? Very, about nine kilograms I had. Nine kilograms total. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that a back, is that a backpack? I, bet I had about, well, yeah. not such a big backpack. Yeah. And I knew everything. I had my 10 meter piece of string, hang up the mosquito net, fix yes. my backpack, hang up my laundry. Right. I had a couple of books, which I'd switch when I finished them. Yep. A couple of, some clothes. Were you going to a monastery? Was there a place? At, uh, I went, I lived, I spent lots of time in monasteries and uh-huh. caves and temples mm-hmm. and things, but I generally lived in real houses. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I taught English. In lots of places I taught English. Oh, that nice. was your job, right? That you, yeah. You paid first, first place I went was Sri Lanka, because the most random place I could think of at the time. Right. That was the reason? So I went, yeah, oh. exactly yeah. the reason. I looked on the map and I was like, Sri Lanka. I <laughs> don't know anything about yeah. it. I'm going, that's where I'm going. Uh-huh. And I went there, and the wow. day I arrived, in the middle of this forest, I, I worked in a farming co-op in this village, and I just felt that I'd come home. Wow. I felt I was like, ali- I felt alive. Yeah. And there was, it had nothing to do with my life at all. Mm-hmm. Nothing looked the same. T- the food was different, the culture was different, the everything was completely, and I never felt so alive and at home. I was like, wow. Whew. I always wonder, how you found it, like, when you went there, did you... I mean, did you ask someone where to go? Like, how did you know where to go? Most of the countries I went to, I 
would find a base first before mm. I got there. So I found an organization that I could volunteer with in Sri Lanka. Okay. And uh, so they sent me to the main hub in a city, a beautiful little town actually. But then they said, where do you want to go? You can stay here or we've got branches in the countryside. Mm. I was like, get me yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to this place, no electricity, no Whoa. water, and just lived in this village with these people. I mean, it was so wonderful. Wow. It was so wonderful. And you were teaching them English. I was teaching them English and I'd help them farm and do things yeah. with my middle class Jewish <laughs> hands. <laughs> so I'd ripped up my hands very early on, but I was like, yeah. at least I'm, they did all the work, to be yeah. fair. <laughs> <laughs> It was very sweet. And then I spent most, when I wasn't teaching and farming, I just sat in the temples all the, all, all the time. Can you describe what those temples looked like or what the, the landscape was like in Sri Lanka? Rainforest. Rainforest. Most, uh, just beautiful forest and lush, uh, tropical wow. plantations. Amazing place. And then you have these very, very, very peaceful temples, top of the hills with... Just go and sit there quiet. Often would see snakes coming past. And, and that was fine. Yeah. Did you have a mentor that when you went to these temples, that I, helped you I would to speak to meditate? the monk. Oh, you would? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so wherever I went, I found a person who could teach me, yeah. guide me. But I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time alone. Yeah. Very important. Once again, it's the same thing. People don't like being alone yeah. because when they're actually alone, they realize they're not alone. They've got those 10 voices in their head. Right. But if you can't be alone, then you can't really be with other people. If you're being with other people just to escape your loneliness, and you're very social and you're loving, you're not really there for them. You're, you need them. Mm -hmm. But someone who can truly, everyone says, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Or The truth is, a healthy human being is both. Someone who can be truly introverted on their own, they could be truly extra, truly be there for other people, rather than some people are alone because they're scared of being around people. Yeah. And some people are always around people because they're scared of being, being alone. alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get that balance. Someone who could be deeply, deeply alone and be very happy being alone. Our sages actually teach us that's the, the core faculty of our soul. Adam was created alone in the Garden of Eden. So your soul needs to have it alone. So we've oh, lost nice. connection with the most basic faculty of our soul, which yeah, is the I'm ability sure. to be alone. However, the Torah then says you're not meant to be alone. You're not meant to be alone. Right. Right. You're, not meant to, you're not meant to be alone. You're meant to be with other people, but you can only truly be with someone else when you can be alone, mm -hmm. when you're not so needy and reliant and dependent. I don't, I'm not dependent on you. I'm okay. Then I can really be there for you and, and be together and make something greater. So I, trying to, so I spent lots of time alone. It was, wonderful. was that natural for you? Or was that fighting no, your nature? I was, no, I was a dance music DJ right. and the captain of the football team. And I was, I was like, the party, I was, I was that guy. I was the, mm -hmm. That's who I was. But then I realized it's all fake. I just, I, just, I don't want that. Wow. So that was Sri Lanka. And you learned that. Sri Lanka. Then I went to Thailand for a year and a half. Thailand, I did lots of 10-day silent meditation retreats. Lots of them. Yeah. Well, not a lot. Three, four. Okay, that, that is Which a is lot. Quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it sounded like 50. I think. <laughs> and it silent meditation retreats, which is immensely, immensely challenging. <laughs> but once again, if your whole experience of existence is whatever's going on in your mind, then you have to at some point learn to deal with your mind. And there's no better way to do that than on a 10-day silent meditation retreat. Not only silence, no reading, no writing, no listening to music, no phones, no TVs, nothing, no distractions. Are you it was a distraction less. In nature, in this temple. In the temple the whole time? Where yeah. you had to go outside? No, it, well, the, the temple's in beautiful nature. They oh, had okay. hot springs there, amazing hot wow. springs. Is that also like a rainforest? What's that like? It was, it was, it was more towards the sea, so it was less foresty. You but could definitely see the sea? Trees, tropical trees. You couldn't see the, tree, the sea from the temples. Mm -hmm. Slept on a wooden bed with a wooden pillow, which was a no block way. of wood. And then the bell goes at 4 o'clock in the morning. Get up, cold bucket of water, shower. And then we did half an hour of Tai Chi, some right. movement. And then we literally sat for about 16 hours. We had one meal at 11 o'clock in the morning, vegetarian meal, and a cup of warm soya milk at 6 p.m. Uh -huh. Apart from that, we basically sat for the whole day doing anapanasati. Ana means breathing in, pana means breathing out, and sati means consciously. Wow. Breathing in, breathing in and out very consciously. Now, after about... 
four minutes, you want to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After about four days, I was like, I'm actually enlightened. Yeah. After about six days, I wanted to run away. <laughs> After about eight days, I was like, it was a complete journey of wow. everything coming up. and No talking, uh, no writing, no reading, no nothing. No. We had one pamphlet that we could read about the meditation practice. But after you read it 4,000 <laughs> times, it's like, I'm not really wow, that. That's and, uh, unbelievable. Oh, great. Did you get to talk to the monk? or was there? If you had questions about the practice, you could book a meeting with the monk. But you okay. couldn't just sit with him and say, ah, I, did it. <laughs> I missed my mom. It was just like, I don't understand what this technique is meant to be. So you could book a meeting. And was so he what? joining you in this meditation? Yeah, so the monks could speak. The monk would sit up there and give us the instruction. Okay. So after this 10 days, was there, was there this of, of complete no talking, no nothing? Was there like a Motsi Shabbos? Was there like a party afterwards or anything? Yeah, I guess we all, <laughs> we all went to the Thai islands and just had, had a party then. I mean, what would you do? I mean, do you go to pizza? Like, think it seriously, like, like after 10 days of no talking. I think you're just on a much clearer level of consciousness at that point. You're not, you don't want to go partying. Yeah. Yeah, it's I would not imagine. Like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. At some point, when you tap into true consciousness and spirituality, that stuff just isn't so attractive anymore. Yeah. All the partying and all the stuff is really, is, uh, is an intense, effortless, very pleasurable escape. Mm -hmm. But once you're not escaping anymore, then that it, it doesn't have the draw anymore. Yeah. So I don't, so people say to me, do you miss that? And I'm like, not so much. I'm living an immensely v vital, meaningful, passionate, amazing life. So then, you know. Yeah, it's easy to have wanderlust when you describe these yeah. beautiful destinations. I don't. Want, I don't know if you're going to get to this point yet, but I wanted as a question. I don't. I don't remember. You know, in your book, Mastering Life, which um, you know, you came to when I was in Washington. You came like in 2012, and I still remember you standing there talking to us, and it was vi very memorable. The first time I met you, you mm. were friends with, uh, still friends with Rabbi Buxbaum. And as soon as this book came out, I read it. But I don't remember how you got from uh, Eastern Asia to Israel. I don't remember that. What brought you here? Can you enlighten us? What yes. I was going to go to South America to, to canoe down the Amazon. Okay. So I'd been in Thailand and India for a year and a half and Japan for a year and a half and Nepal and China and it's a small island off the coast of Korea for a year and a half. We just had a whole year and a half on this island? Yeah, it wasn't that. It was a decent island. It had some big cities on it. Okay. It wasn't a like, desert <laughs> island. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. No, it was a guy. I, my, my taekwondo master was six foot four or something. Former high school national champion of Korea. Okay. Taekwondo. Oh, yeah. And a big alcoholic. Terrible combination. Oh, really? gosh. When you're, the, when you're the white guy. Yeah. He beat me up a lot. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> it does make you strong, conditioning. Yeah. Anyway, so that was six years in Asia, and I was going to go to South America t to A, canoe down the Amazon, mm -hmm. and B, I wanted to do a shaman training ayahuasca mushroom three-month course. Okay. Oh. And I stopped in Israel. Why do you stop Why? in Israel? Why? I just had some friends, because I lived in Israel for three months, and I had some friends and people I wanted to visit. I just thought I'd stop on my way. Okay. You can make it on the way. Yeah. Go the yeah. opposite direction. And because I lived in India for a year and a half, I had lots of Israeli friends, because 60,000 oh, right. Israeli backpackers yes. go to India a year. Oh, so wow. I, I learned most of my Hebrew in India, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I went, and I had loads of places to stay, couch yeah. surfing, yeah, sure. all these Israeli backpackers. So it felt like I was back in India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at one point, someone said to me, you're Jewish. Why don't you learn about Judaism? And I said, because it's not spiritual and it's not true. And religious people aren't even very nice, <laughs> let alone spiritual. And the prayer book's a bit weird. You just tell God how great he is the whole time. It's so like God's very insecure. These were right? things that you remembered even while you were in, in Asia. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I was like, and I, I don't believe there's an angry man in the sky who's going to punish me if I don't do all his silly little rules. Mm -hmm. so I, but someone said, go up to Swat. Swat is the like Nepal <laughs> of yeah, Israel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and I started learning. And I saw, wow, Judaism's got immense, profound depth and wisdom. And we don't believe there's an angry man in the sky with a set of rules. And it's actually an angry woman in the sky. <laughs> 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 no, we don't believe. We believe God is the divine, conscious reality. 
And that spoke, that's my language, by the way, yeah. from where I came from. Yeah. Not in Buddhism, by the way. Buddhism is really atheist. Uh, so, but Hinduism, divine conscious reality, and the Torah is a guidebook to reaching your your ultimate potential as a divine being. I said, mm -hmm. so this is my language. I was like, okay, I hear that. That's my language. Um, so I stayed and I was learning. And then I had a question. It's my question that I'd been asking all the time. How do you know this is true? Yeah, very important question. That's, that's, that's very that's important, important question. That's the one question that I asked, you know, yeah. 15 years ago. Very important. So I said to my Buddhist masters, I love Buddhism. I can teach Buddhism. But how do you know this is true? Because you say we don't have a soul. And they say, you are a soul, so you can't both be right. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, Buddha said so. And I said, but how do you know Buddha got it right? And he said, because you can experience it for yourself in your meditation. And I said, well, you, you experience something in your meditation, and then you put your Buddhist education on that experience. Yeah, right. <laughs> so he's probably, the Christian experiences the same thing in his meditation. So when he comes out, he says that was Christ consciousness. Right. Mm -hmm. And you say that's Buddha mind. And so that's not evidence. No. I was like, what's your evidence that this is true? So I, that was a big question for me. I did philosophy at university. I'm very into what's your evidence. Yeah. So I, I had this balance. I was very spiritually seeking, but I was also very rational. Yeah. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not believing it just because it feels right. You don't, you don't have blind faith. No, absolutely yeah. not. Blind faith. No, you thought they're everything, it sounds like. I really had. I had to. I felt people, some people say, if you don't believe what I believe, you're going to hell for all of eternity. Well, that's really serious. Yeah. <laughs> if what they believe is true, I better start doing that yes. because right. I don't want to go to hell for all of eternity. So I, was, I needed to find the evidence for what people believe. And mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure it existed necessarily. So what I used to say, and I, lots of, I hear lots of people saying this, I'm spiritual, not religious. Yeah. I'm spiritual, and it sounds so good. It does. It's, uh, that's, that's true. But of course, it, because religion is dogmatic, male chauvinistic, man-made, ritualistic, serving the guy in the sky, and right, it's just, that's not spiritual. Religion, the word, even religion, yeah, that's not spiritual, whereas I'm spiritual, I'm loving, and open, and compassionate, and, and I'm meditating, I'm doing all these things. So, so if I find what resonates with me, as long as I'm not hurting other people, it resonates with me, and that's my truth. And there is something very beautiful about that. Very beautiful. Mm -hmm. But I suddenly had this question. And I was like, hold on a second. Just because something resonates with me doesn't mean that's, that's true. true. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just my upbringing. Or maybe it's just that I want it to be true. It makes me feel better than true. There has to be a truth that's got nothing to do with me. And what I need to do is find out what is that truth. And then I have to learn to resonate with the truth. It's a very different system. Not the other way around. It, and I realized it's actually very egotistical the other way around. What I, what I want and what I believe, that must, that's true for me. Don't tell me what to believe and do. Dogmatic and you're putting it on me. Then I realized it takes immense humility to be religious. Because mm -hmm. I'm saying it's not up to me. That God, there's a God who sets the rules for my own benefit, by the way. God's not telling me to do things because God needs me to do those things. So, so I started seeing God and religion in general as a martial arts master. Mm -hmm. Why did my martial arts masters want me to do push-ups on my fingers like that? Very painful. It's not because they needed it. It's because if you want to become a martial arts master, you have to have very strong fingers. So I, if I said, yeah, that just doesn't resonate with me. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I don't, so I, I understood that there's something that's true. There is an objective truth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find out what the truth is, and I'm going to live according to the truth rather than trying to make up what I think is true. By the way, I worked out later it's even more serious than this because we believe that the religion is the guidebook to spirituality. It's a spiritual guidebook. The Torah is the God-given divine spiritual guidebook. So in fact, you can't be spiritual without being religious. Mm. It's not called being spiritual. Because spiritual, we've got to define what does spiritual even mean. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spiritual doesn't mean that I do hot Bikram yoga and smoke weed and watch the sunrise and <laughs> gluten-free, sugar-free. <laughs> Although that's wonderful and I did that a lot. And, <laughs> I, and you know what people doing that are very sweet, conscious mm. 
lovely people. Yeah. Most of my friends are still like that. I love them. <laughs> Often they're much more conscious, sweeter people than the religious people I yes. know. I hear yeah. that. I hear that. But that's not what spirituality means. Spirituality means connecting to, identifying as, and manifesting my soul. That's my spirit. So the Torah is a guidebook for doing that. So if I'm not following the Torah, I'm not really doing that as much as I could be. So I realized, hold on, I better, I'm going to work it out. So I asked my question again, how do you know this is true? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I got an answer. Oh, you, they didn't even answer it before? I, no, they gave me answers, but they weren't rational answers. Okay. For the first time, I got the only rational answer there is, which is we have evidence. We have evidence. Wh where, where do these answers come from? Ish. Oh, <laughs> which is where you teach. On a and now basis. I teach now here because it's very, very empowering. And you're like the, one of the most popular speakers in the Jewish world today. <laughs> and I, I come in here and I see you like dancing on those tables and you know, <laughs> 100 students around you. It's, what a pleasure to watch you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, you know. Well, what a pleasure to be able to empower people. Yeah. And to, but I know what they're thinking. They're thinking this religious brainwashed guy and he's going to tell me that I'm a sinner. And they don't realize that the number one key teaching in Judaism is that you are intrinsically beautiful, lovable, and worthy. You're a radiant divine light. And you have to live up to that. And they're like, what? Judaism teaches that? And I'm like, yes. That's what the whole Torah is teaching you. It's teaching you about controlling your mind and having a positive attitude and living with values and having healthy families and... So people don't realize. So for me, it's not work. My wife doesn't say, how was work today? Like, I didn't get to work. <laughs> I just know. came and like, and someone said to me, I used to think like the rabbis, they're right and they want to prove me wrong. But I didn't feel like that with you. I just thought that we we're on the same team. And I was like, we are. <laughs> it's like, imagine you see the best movie ever. You just want to share it with your friends. Sure. So I'm like, I've got an amazing thing that I want to share with you. And I'm not trying to prove you wrong and prove me right. And I'm not getting offensive and I'm not getting defensive. I, this is just what I found. And in fact, very, very important, when I first got here and I started becoming more observant, someone said to me, amazing, because lots of Jews are into Eastern spirituality and Buddhism. Now you can give a class and really just put down Buddhism, show them why it's bad. Yeah. And I said, what are you talking <laughs> about? If I have to put down someone else to look good, yeah. what does that say about me? Sure. I'm not putting down Buddhism. By the way, I think Buddhism is beautiful and powerful. I just don't think it's true. Right. It's not true. Now, there's something called truth. Buddhism says you don't have a soul. I don't think that's true. Yeah. But still, they teach beautiful ideas about compassion sure. and happiness and meditation. I'm not putting them down. I just want to show you how beautiful Judaism is. Yeah, someone else, a very powerful line, said, if you become more religious... And therefore, you look down on other people, especially other Jews. They're conservative and they're reform. Then you didn't become religious. You became self-righteous. Yeah. Because the closer you are to God and truth and Torah, the more you love people and the more you accept people and the more you acknowledge people. They, people just don't know. I didn't know growing up. I wasn't a bad person. I did, most of the Torah isn't to do with being a good or bad person. If you eat not kosher food, you're not a bad person. You might be the most lovely, wonderful, moral, sweet, lovely person in the world. In fact, I know people who keep strictly kosher and they're not very nice <laughs> people at all. So it's not a, it's not a value judgment. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual guidebook. What's spiritually good for you? What do you need in order to reach your potential as a soul? That's it. That's our thing. So I get very excited about sharing that with people. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, uh, when I was learning with one of my students back in, in, in Washington, D.C., he had a hard time understanding that we're a soul and a body. How do you explain, and I, and I have something that I use to explain, I give three different examples, but how do you explain the difference between a body and a soul to your students? I want to hear yours first. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, uh, and I and this might be the same one used, because I, I learned it from Rabbi Dubov this past year, about if you have a friend that walks into the house and he's coming to watch a football game with you, and next thing he passes, he, he, he falls down, has a massive heart attack, and he's dead. Your friend Joey's dead. No, oh, Joey's dead. Joey's dead. Nine one one comes. No, 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 the ambulance comes. They do CPR. They can't revive him, and he's dead on the ground. And he's, Joey, Joey's gone. Then your friend, you know, Mike walks in. Mike goes, "What's going on?" He goes, "Joey, Joey's gone. Joey's gone." And Mike goes, "No, he's not. He's right there on the ground." I'm like, "No, no, he's dead. He's. They, they said he's dead. He's dead." He goes, "He's gone." He, Mike says, "No, Joey's right there." No, he's not. He's gone. Well, 
is, is Joey there or not there? Hmm. What's the answer? <laughs> his body's there. His body's there. The but he's not there. But he's not there. So who is the he that's not there? That's the difference between the soul and the body. But I also have two other explanations that we live with constantly. That I don't know if I learned this from Rev. Dubar, uh, Rev. Duboff, but one of them is my concept, one idea, is that you know I ran a, a ten mile race one time called the Army Ten Mile in D.C. And when I came home, you know, ten miles is a long distance, right? I came home, I had three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, I passed out on the couch for 10, 20 minutes, woke up, and getting off the couch, my feet hurt, my legs hurt, my back hurt, I was sunburned, I was exhausted, I'm sore for running on blacktop for 10 miles. How do I feel? I feel great. I feel great, I ran 10 miles, and my body's in pain. That's my soul leading my body. You know, they say the runner's high is when the body and soul are in sync together, at a piece together. So that's the second example. The third example is pizza, which I love pizza. And I'll eat three slices, and there'll be a fourth slice sitting there. And I mean, this might have come from you. And like, I, I want to eat the fourth slice. My body wants it, but I know I shouldn't eat it because, you know, I don't, I don't want to gain too much weight. But my body wins out, eat the slice. I get pleasure for like 30 seconds. I eat the pizza, pleasure. But then I feel horrible after I eat it. But why do I feel horrible? Because my soul's unhappy because I ate that slice. But my body was happy for like 30 seconds. Now both my body and my soul are miserable from eating that fourth slice because I led with my body and not my soul. So three different examples. One mm. where the body and soul are separate. Another one where my soul was happy even though my body's in pain from running. And the third example is where I'm, my body's unhappy and my soul's unhappy even though I ate something that I really liked. That's kind of like my, how I define the body-soul relationship. I hear Thank you. Now I had time to think of my answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one, does one of these come from you? None of no. Okay. <laughs> because in that case, I wouldn't know. Because you could just feel good about yourself for doing the right thing. That's an emotional feel good about myself without there necessarily needing to be a soul. What's the soul? What's the soul's part in that? As opposed to the emotional, I just feel good about myself. An atheist yeah. would also feel good about themselves for not having that pizza. Right. So what's really the soul? What does it mean? So this is how I think of it. Okay. Say I exist. You exist. No. Say I exist. I, I exist. Say I exist. I exist. Who are you referring to? I'm referring to my soul. I'm referring okay, well, you, you've okay. already jumped to the answer. Oh, right, okay. I'm referring to... <laughs> is your body you? When you say I exist, you're not referring to your body. No. Are you referring to your job? Are you mm. referring to your car? No. Are you referring to your emotions? Do your emotions define you? No, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. I'm experiencing... They define how I feel. Yeah, but who feels? Who is feeling your emotions? It's good. Let's go deeper. Your thoughts. Do your thoughts define you? No. No, because sometimes you have thoughts you don't agree with. Right. You're like, oh, I don't believe that. That was a disgusting thought. I don't believe that. Whose thoughts are they? Who's experiencing that thought? That's well, my brain. That's my control center. Whose brain? My brain. Who? Who's my? Who are you? Who's my? Right. Who has the brain? Who's experiencing all of that? So you're saying it's not my body, it's my it's soul. It's not your body, it's not your emotion. Whose emotions, soul, whose talents are they? If you, if you stop being good at tennis, are you not you? So some people say, who I am is a conglomeration of all my memories and challenges and experiences and all that. But who had all of those things? Who experienced? That's not who you are. If we take away one of your memories, you haven't lost any part of you. If you show me a photo of you when you're five years old, mm -hmm. you had a completely different body, completely different memories, completely different hopes, dreams, issues, so you're desires. Saying that, that's, that's not you. Yeah. No one would say that's not me. Everyone says, that's me when I'm five. But if you say you're just a, a conglomeration of everything, then that's not true. There was a you that existed when you were five, and the same you that exists now, mm -hmm. there is a you. What is that blank consciousness onto which all of your psyche and all of the external world is being projected? That's your soul. That's your pure consciousness. Our problem is that we've completely lost consciousness of ourself. We're not, very few people ever experience 
themselves existing. When was the last time you experienced just the fact that you exist? What do you do? People don't even know what I'm talking about now. They're like, right. what are you talking about? That's weird. But what's this? <laughs> you've, got a blank, you've got a blank screen. There's a blank screen and you're projecting something onto the screen. Mm -hmm. You have consciousness. Now I can see that door. That's what's being projected onto my consciousness. But there's a me that is perceiving the door. Then there's an ego me, which is, I like that door, I don't like that door, I wish I had that door, mm -hmm. I, I remember that last time I saw that person at that door. Mm -hmm. But there's still a me who's aware of that voice judging everything, so that even that ego voice isn't me. So if you keep going back and back and back and back and back, there is the experiencer of all of these things. And by the way, it's not only a door that's projected onto your consciousness, it's also your own emotions are projected onto your consciousness, and your thoughts. Our problem is... The projection never stops. It's a 24 hour a day, seven days a week projection. So we never get to experience the blank screen. To just experience blank. And that's what meditation really is. Mm -hmm. Closing my eyes to the external world, calming my mind, letting my emotions wash over me, coming to a place of immense peace of mind where I get to just experience blank screen. That's I, it. I heard a concept that <laughs> meditation is like listening to God where prayer is talking to God. Have you ever heard anything like that? I've heard something like that. Because we're praying, you know, we're not listening, we're actually speaking to God when yeah. we pray. And like one of but is meditation listening is to God? Me is meditation is when you're listening to the... You we're going to have to define meditation. I define right. meditation as the practice of calming and controlling your mind. That's what meditation is. Now, maybe from a very deep place of meditation, you could then kind of hear God. Right. But for me, listening to God is learning Torah. Because yeah. <laughs> the Torah is telling me what God thinks and wants from yeah. me. So what's happened really, this is a very, very powerful example. Powerful example is, have you ever been to a movie, a film? What do you call it where you're from? Movie? A movie. movie. Have you ever been to a movie? And it's an action, like the born identity. Yeah. And you're there, and you are so enraptured in the movie, do you actually lose all sense of self? You don't feel I'm sitting here enjoying the movie. You are in the, the movie. movie. yeah. And you're not thinking about your emails mm -hmm. and you're not hungry or you're, you're just in it. You've lost all sense of self. Yeah. And then the movie finishes and then you look around and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. I'm back in yeah. Seattle. Yeah. And you put on your coat and it's cold and you yeah. walk home. And then you talk about the movie and then suddenly you come back to being there's a self. Basically, what's happened is we've fallen into the movie of our psyche. We've so got caught up in our thoughts and our emotions and our hopes and our dreams and our everything. We've got so caught up in it, we've actually lost any sense of there's a self, there's a neshama, there's a soul, there's a consciousness. So what we need to do is pull ourselves back, come and sit back in the seat and say, okay, I'm watching a movie. I actually went to the dinosaur exhibition in the Bota Botanical Gardens in Jerusalem. Okay. Unbelievable. Cool. It's got those big dinosaurs, waggly tails, rah. But at the end, they've got a tent, virtual reality goggles, and a revolving chair. It was one of the best things I've ever done. So we got, uh, they started playing this movie, uh -huh. and you were on a pterodactyl's back and you're flying, and you could look around and see, uh, you could see a wow. volcano over there. Tyrannosaurus said, look up, look down. You were in it and you could spin on your chair. You were in that is this. Wild. It was literally one of the best things I've ever done. Cool. And my daughter got a bit scared. She like, I can't do it. It was, too re it was so real. And she felt that she was falling. And then we jumped off the pterodactyl and got on a, a triceratops back. And then we were riding through the forest. And, and it was 3D coming at you. And Whoa. So it was amazing. Amazing. So then we took the goggles off. And my son, Binyamin, eight years old, he was loving it. He was like, Abba, that was amazing. We're in that one. And we're sitting down, had an ice cream. I said to them, I just want you to know that we're wearing goggles right now. And they know me. They've lived with me for long <laughs> enough. <laughs> and this world, it, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you've got to learn to take off the goggles. That's meditation. But you're not... Jewish tradition teaches you're not meant to go and sit in a cave no. and get away. No. You're meant to be involved in the world. But remember you got goggles on. Remember you got goggles on. Yeah. 
Right. It's just there's a soul that is experiencing the dinosaur world. There's a soul that's experiencing the physical reality. But don't forget you're a soul. The soul doesn't get offended. So if someone's going to insult you, if you're this body ego, you, you, it means you got caught up in the play. You, you've forgotten that, hold on, you're, you're just kind of playing a part. That, have you ever seen Ransom? Mel Gibson. Yes, I did see it. His daughter, his son, his son gets kidnapped. kidnapped. Yes. So I love Mel Gibson yeah. acting. I know he has some issues with the Jews. Right. In terms of I, like Braveheart, one of my favorite films. It's a great. Film. Oh, it's a great. He's a great actor. Anyway, one point in the movie, he's on the phone to the kidnappers, and they say, "If you don't bring me the money, we're going to shoot your yeah. son." And he goes, "You can't." Blah, blah, blah. And then he hears a gunshot. Bam! And Mel lights. He just can't believe, and he drops the phone, and his wife starts screaming at him, how could you do that? He walks out onto his big balcony, he's a very rich man, and he looks down over the balcony, he's going to kill himself, oh, and no. eventually he just curls up in the corner of the balcony, crying, bitter, painful. It's a very, very powerful scene. Yeah. <laughs> Method acting at its best. Now imagine that then they said, cut, <laughs> Mel! Oscar, that was a <laughs> bad ever. <laughs> and Mal's just like, no, <laughs> no, they killed my son and you want me to come for lunch? <laughs> and they'd be like, well, Mal, 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 that was great. Stop. Right. Burger King, everyone. And he's like, I'll tell you. All <laughs> That's what we've done. You got so caught up in the movie that you've lost all sense of who you really are. So that's what the soul is. The soul is the, the, ultimate consciousness that is being aware of this projected world and but Jewish wisdom says but we have to interact with that world but from a much higher level of consciousness mm. wow. wow that, that was, was good. A great that's a good example yeah yeah so that is the soul and the body the um, the meeting point of spiritual and the physical now how do we cope with the fact that we are not only spiritual beings because we also live in this physical world how do we balance all that together because on one hand, we are also actors of that movie. Yes. So I really find this is the distinction between the East and the West and Judaism. The West, where I grew up, is literally all about sex and money. Really, I noticed it a lot. Everyone, that's where I get my sense of self, and that's what success, that's what success is. Everything is sold based on sex and how what your body looks like is. So... This is big generalizations, obviously. Yeah. So the East is to be spiritual, you have to separate yourself completely from physicality. Buddhist monk doesn't get married, never touches a woman, doesn't touch money, doesn't eat nice food. Lots of, I fasted once for seven days. I had two small cups of water a day, and on some days a little bit of papaya because it cleanses you. I actually walked three hours up a mountain to see the Dalai Lama while I was fasting. fasting. I know. I had, a, I had half an apple that day. It didn't help a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, wow. so so no sex, no money, no nice food, no sleeping on a bed, no nothing. Judaism says there's a balance. There's a balance. This is why Israel's in the middle of the East and the West. Yeah. What you have to do is you have to be living in the physical world on such a high level of consciousness that you're actually making the physicality a path to spirituality. For example, of course you can have physical intimacy, but just with the right person, at the right time, for the right reason, in the right way, as an act of love, as an act of giving. We believe you are two parts of one soul that come together once you're married, and the physical union of, of a man and a woman, that is what completes the circuit. It completes the spiritual circuit. We've got spiritual, intellectual, emotional, physical. So we want the whole circuit to be connected. So that's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And money, you can be rich. Just give 10% away immediately. It's not even yours. At least 10% give it away and use your money to help people. You can have nice food. Just make sure it's kosher and make sure you don't eat too much and make sure you make a blessing before you eat it and you have a blessing after you eat it. So it's a very, very healthy balance of saying I'm not cutting off the physical material world, but I'm not defining myself by it and it's not the goal. The goal isn't physical material pleasure. Mm -hmm. The goal is deep conscious connection 
to yourself and to your partner and to your friends and to everyone in the world, all of humanity and to God. That's what the goal of the pleasures of this world is. Some people make a mistake and say the goal is the pleasure. Yes. My goal mm. is to get the pleasure of these things. Wrong. Pleasure is not for pleasure's sake. Pleasure, the real goal of pleasure is connection. Connection. I'm going to use this pleasure to be connected to other people. So wow. that's what Judaism is teaching. It's this amazing balance. And that's what you found on, your, on this whole journey when you settled Well, yes, but it's very hard. Of course. Buddha was right. Buddha was right. We can't really do that. Oh, you can't be in the physical world without getting attached. And once you get attached, that's going to cause suffering. So just get away. And he's basically almost right. But we have the Torah. The Torah is a guidebook. How can you do it? We have rules. Eat this much. Say this before you eat it. And you think, ah, oh, burdensome obligations to make the guy in the sky happy. It's not. It's the ultimate martial art guidebook to be able to interact with the physical material world in such a conscious way that you are using it to become a spiritually aware person. That's so what Judaism is. Yeah, so you must have loved the fact that you now have you've lived in the West and you've lived in the East. And then when you got to Israel, you found the, the point where you take the physical parts of things that we enjoy, the sex and the food and the material goods, and you've taken the the Buddha's view, which is completely separate it, but taking those things, but elevating it to a level where you're living your life in a spiritual manifestation of these all things were given to me with gratitude, and I have to elevate them in order to enjoy them for the, for the good, not for, you know, fake pleasures. Yeah, You know. exactly. Yeah, wow. I'm curious, I know, I know people who have approached Judaism and asked me, um, now that I'm growing in my Judaism, well, why do, you, why do you have all these rules? Do all of them make sense to you on this spiritual perspective? And um, how do you approach the ones that don't? That's a good question. When it comes to rules, imagine you never played the piano ever before. Right. You know, I want to play the piano, and you sit down, and you look at it, and you're like, right. Rah. Someone comes up to you and says, I just want to teach you a jazz scale. And you mm -hmm. say, no, <laughs> don't. Burden me with your rules. I'm just going to express myself. It's like, well, you're an idiot. Then. <laughs> or, my wife's an amazing artist. And I'm not an amazing artist. Why is she an amazing artist? Because she went to art school, <laughs> where she learned about tone and shade and perspective. And so she knows it's only through the rules in everything, by the way. Everything you do. Sport, music, art, uh, brain surgery, business. There are rules. And the rules aren't there to repress you. The rules are there to help you fully express yourself. If I went into the martial arts dojo and I said, I'm going to fight someone. And my master says, come on, you've got to do this a thousand times. A thousand times. I'm like, no. You're going to get knocked out, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so the rules are the, there is no freedom without the rules. I remember when I was becoming more observant, my friend said to me, you're so unlucky. You used to be free. You could eat what you like, sleep with who you like, smoke what you like, do you could do anything you like. And now you can't do it, you're not, you're not free anymore. I said to him, that's not freedom. Freedom isn't doing whatever you feel like doing. That's called slavery. It's slavery to your desires, slavery to your ego, to your society. That's called slavery. Slavery to needing to feel good. That's not freedom. Freedom is understanding the goal, understanding the rules and tools that I need in order to achieve the goal and having the self-discipline to invest in those things. I'm really free. So someone who says, no, I'm free to play the piano, you're not free. I'm free because I've learned the scales. I've le that's, I'm f I'm f the, the rules set me free. Mm -hmm. So most of the rules, Judaism says it's very important to understand the meaning. Why are we doing what we're doing? Someone came here, <laughs> an American footballer, Jewish American footballer, I don't think you get many of them, but he said, Shabbos, Shabbat doesn't do it for me. So I said, well, what do you know about Shabbat? <laughs> and he said, you can't turn lights on and off, can't turn toilet paper. And I was like, well, American football doesn't do it for me. <laughs> and he said, well, you're English, you don't know about American football. And I said, yes, I do. He goes, what do you know? And I said, you wear helmets. <laughs> and he was like, that's what you know? So That's a good example. I actually had to speak it out to him because he was American. <laughs> <laughs> 
If all you know about American football is that they wear helmets, you're not going to enjoy it. If I spend three months leading up to the Super Bowl, I will learn, will learn everything. The linebacker, the quarterbacker, the different types of moves, the rivalry between the teams, how much he was bought from the other team. What is, uh, then I'm going to enjoy the Super Bowl. But if I don't, and I go, I'll enjoy it a bit, maybe. If all you know about Shabbat is that you can't turn on lights and you can't turn on toilet paper. Of course he doesn't enjoy it. There's no reason why. Why would he? Uh, yeah. Exactly. But then you've got to understand why. Why not turn on lights? Why not? So one very, very simple answer for all the rules of Judaism is just so that you're more conscious. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. It's a very yeah. simple thing. You have to put on your right shoe first and then your left shoe. Why? Because if you put on your left shoe first, God's going to punish you? Absolutely <laughs> not. But it gives you a moment of consciousness. I have to be aware of what I'm doing, especially if you don't know your right from your left. <laughs> right. And then Kabbalah teaches right <laughs> represents chesed, love and kindness. Yeah. I want to bring love and kindness into my life. I want to be that sort of person who loves everyone, even if they don't agree with me, even if they have different beliefs to me. So left is gavura, strength. Strength means uh, I have to have boundaries. I can't just be only loving and giving and kind. I've got to have boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. So every single do, every, every little detail is helping us be conscious and intentional and make everything very deeply meaningful. Now you've got a very good question because I can understand that with my shoes and right and left. There are some things I just don't understand so much. Why? So why do I still do them? They're very, very obvious why I still do them. Because once you trust the authority and the authority says this is what you need to do, you don't necessarily need to understand everything. Once you, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says you need to take this medicine, you don't have to do a seven-year medical degree and a five-year pharmacy degree. Is I trust this doctor, so I'm going to do it. However, it means you're not going to get the deepest meaning out of it. So it's right. still always, always looking. But I'm not, some people say, I'll only do it when I understand it. I'll only take that medicine when <laughs> I have had a seven-year medical <laughs> degree. <laughs> and it, That's a stupid thing to do. Yeah, I'm going right. to do it even if I don't fully understand it because I trust the authorities, but then I'm going to start asking. I'm going to say, why do we do this? What's the Kabbalah? What's the mysticism behind it? I want to work it all out. So we also believe that there's a, there's a spiritual world. Not only is there a spiritual world, but the spiritual world's the real world. So, for example, turning on a light. Someone actually came to my house once for Shabbos. Probably happened to you too. A very bad attitude. And they came up to me <laughs> and they went to the light switch and said, Rabbi, what do you think would happen if I press this? And I said... I think the light would go, go off. off. <laughs> and he was like, oh. so what do you think would happen? <laughs> well, the God would thunder in the lightning. But the truth is, I heard this example. Imagine I wrote a 50,000 word essay on my computer and I hadn't saved it in the cloud. Oh and yeah. then a three-year-old son comes along and he just turns off the computer. Yeah. I didn't save it. I'm freaking out with him. How can you do? What have you done? And he says, mm. what do you mean? I just pressed the button. <laughs> but he doesn't realize there are consequences to pressing that button. So we believe there's a spiritual reality. And by pressing that button on Shabbat, and obviously the more you learn about this, <laughs> the, the, it has spiritual... Create, is the Shabbat is a day of rest. By s turning on and off the light, you're making creation, you're creating a spark, you're creating right. something. So you've, you're actually taking away from the deep peace of creation the peacefulness of creation on that day. Are you a bad person? No. Absolutely not. Does God hate you? No. no. Is he angry? No. no. It's just that you just missed out on a moment of consciousness. That's it. That's, so that's why I do it. And by the way, once you're in it, from the outside looking in, it looks very hard. Oh my goodness, how do you do it? Right. When you're doing it, it's not hard you're at all. Yeah. It's not like all the day I'm thinking, oh, I can't call God. I, I just tear paper before Shabbat and I've got the... I got, it's actually so simple. Very You're not simple. worried about anything. Like the hot plate's on, everything is set. So good. Love that. Can I ask a few of, of my favorite questions? Please. Before we wrap up? Okay. So one of them is, do you mind sharing one of or your most spiritual experience? It could be personal and you could say no. Hmm. Before psychedelics or after? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I ask this is because we were touching a lot about the evidence. We, we touched on it and moved on. Um, but I have found that the evidence is super strong and very convincing. But at a certain point, if you're not emotionally connected mm. to it, it's not real. So my qu that's why I asked this question. What were some of the, or one of the experiences that made it real to you? Well, 
firstly, you're right. The, the reason I believe what I believe, the foundation of my belief is completely rational. It's because I got evidence a human being didn't write the Torah. That's completely right. rational. www.aryourite.org. I put some of the evidence there. Very rational thing. But my Jewish practice has got nothing to do with the evidence. It's all about the heart and the soul. Um, so we have moments in the year, the festivals, that are immensely powerful portals of God consciousness. And for me and for many Jews who understand, which is exactly the opposite for Jews who don't understand, Yom Kippur is the highest day of the year. Mm -hmm. Yom Kippur is a very joyful and is a whole, it feels like a 10 day silent meditation retreat, <laughs> roller coaster, wow. crying, singing, laughing. It's an amazing, amazing day. Now, obviously, how I grew up, it was like, it's the worst day. You just <laughs> I know. Stand up, sit down, Fast. stand up. But that's, n that's not cool. Who will die by fire yeah. and water? Oh, right. I'm, I'm bad and you're good. <laughs> right. Don't hurt me. Terrible. So, what we're really doing when we're beating our chest is opening up our heart. We're saying, hey, heart, remember? Do you remember who you are? The whole, the whole of Yom Kippur is all about remembering who you are. Remember, God, God says that you are already enlightened. You are an enlightened being right now. It's just not that we're not thinking like enlightened being or speaking like them or acting like them. But in our essence, we're an enlightened being. Mm -hmm. So the, the remorse and pain we feel on Yom Kippur is I just really let myself down. By the way, that phrase itself, I let myself down. Who let who down? How many of you <laughs> are there? So we're saying my ego nature and my thoughts, my speech, and my action let down myself, my right. pure conscious divine self. So I'm spending all day opening up my heart. But what happens, I'm sure it's the same for you. You get towards the end of the fast, but then we have this prayer service called Ni'ila. Yeah. And Ni'ila, by the end of that 24 hours, it feels like everyone in the shul has come forward. They've stepped yeah. forward. I heard someone say it's because we got rid of all our sins now. There's more space to go forward. <laughs> we got rid of our ego. Yeah. So we have so everyone's mm. forward. The, the, ark, the holy ark is open. The show fire is blowing. We're screaming out. No one is thinking about eating at that point. Yeah. No one. I can't imagine they are. Right. And uh, the minion I daven in, we daven for an hour after the fast is out. Oh. And then we have Mariv the evening prayer, <laughs> and then we have Kiddush Levana, yeah, and then we, have so one. just that moment of pure mm -hmm. self-nullification, complete physical self-nullification, to be in this world of immense yearning, consciousness, joy, power, and, and so after Yom Kippur, I don't eat, I go and I have some water, I actually have some coconut water, mm -hmm. a bit of coconut water, because I know the second I eat, I know it's going <laughs> to, so I just mm. don't eat for an hour, as long as I can after that, I'm not, not going to eat. Oh. So that's one example. But the truth is, I find that my Jewish practice means I'm living on a quite a mindful, spiritual, conscious level all the time. I'm doing something immensely meaningful with my life. Every bracha, I say a hundred brachas a day, every single one of them I'm trying to feel that I'm speaking to God. So we've had these extremes of Yom Kippur, crazy, but our, my day-to-day -day life, my tefillin, oh my goodness, putting on tefillin every day, I just take time to do it. I feel like I'm binding myself to God and I understand what... Before, when I didn't know what to fill in us, I was like, you're weird. Crazy right. ritual with cow skin, black boxes. Now I understand it's the head and the heart and the actions and what you're doing and the seven Kabbalistic powers. And, and writing God's name on your body. Yeah. For me, every single day when I put on... Actually, my Rabbeinu Tam to fill in, there's a different type of to fill in. You put it on at the end, some people. I feel spiritually, but also physically, it's the, it's the biggest pleasure I get all day. And lunch is like, I'll eat lunch. <laughs> I'll have lunch. But that pleasure of putting on my tefillin every day is very immense and powerful. Wow, and so you're able to just, because you understand it, and because you've spent time learning it, you're able to connect with it. And I know what the bracha mean. What does baruch mean? Blessed. And what right. does blessed mean? Uh, I spoke to a guy who's 27 years old, completely secular. And he knew a lot. So I said, what's going on? He said, from the age of 18 to 24, I was very religious. Black hat, learning Gomorrah. 24, stop being religious. 27, nothing. So I said, okay, so you must have said brachas. You must have said blessings. Right. He goes, of course I did. A hundred blessings a day, the Gomorrah says it. I said, so what does Baruch mean? So he said, blessed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what does that mean? And he said, Holy. And I said, no, that's Kadosh. 
And he said, blessed are you, like, thank you, <laughs> gratitude. And I said, no, that's how they are. And he said, you know. And I said, yeah, I do know. You don't know. You don't <laughs> know what Baruch means. Wow. That's why you're not saying it. You're not saying Baruch now because you had no idea what you were saying. The word Baruch has many meanings. One of them being is you're the source of everything. There's a creator. Everything. Can, what's this made out of? Metal. Where's metal come from? Rocks. Where do rocks come from? The earth. Where does the earth come from? Yeah, Hashem. Everything. Where does this come from? I don't Hashem. even know. Hashem. Glass <laughs> Sand. comes from okay. sand. Everything. From sand. Right. Where does paper come everything, from? Wood. Everything. Wood. Everything. everything you see everywhere, you could take it back to the source. I used to go to a trance night called Return to the Source yeah. <laughs> in London. But now I understand what it's really saying. Yeah. Return. Ev so every time I make a bracha, I'm like, Baruch, that's enough. I'm freaking out. So the word Baruch, I won't fall off my chair. Baruch. <laughs> Atah. I'm actually speaking to the divine creator of the universe who's keeping my heart beating. Baruch Atah. Now most religious people aren't. They're just, Baruch Atah. Yeah. But every moment is an opportunity for immense intention and consciousness and vitality and spirituality. So Judaism doesn't, Judaism says, you know, Learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, praying and meditating, that's holy and that's spiritual. But then you've got to change the diapers and you've got to go to work. Judaism right. says absolutely not. Every single thing is a moment and an opportunity to do it in a conscious, meaningful, intentional way. Everything we do all throughout the day is meaningful. Did you notice that? There's nothing I do that's not meaningful all day. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> that's why the Torah says choose life. Yeah. It's very it, easy to that is real life. see the meaning and ignore it. Escape from it. Escape from it. So, yeah, there's so much more we can talk about. We'd love to have you on the show again. But okay. I want to ask one more question before I ask you a final question. So my final question is, if you had a billboard that the whole world could see, what would it say? What message would you just want to get out there? The message from all my years of philosophy and travel yeah. and Torah and Kabbalah would be two words. Chill out. <laughs> I'm being serious. Yeah. Just okay, chill out. Wow. Not veg out. Yeah. Right. Don't veg out. But ch it's okay. You know? It's okay. You're okay. Life's okay. Everyone's so uptight and anxious nowadays. My message to mankind is chill out. You're doing well. You're okay. It's going to be okay. Everything you ever worried about either didn't happen or it happened it wasn't so bad yeah. or it happened it was bad but you're dealing with it yeah. and I can support you. Wow. So just it's okay. Yeah. How about that? It's just okay. I gave a class about this once. Just called it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. okay. I oh. found people are on a people are on a scale of high anxiety to slightly uneasy. Yeah. No right. one's gone past that into <sighs> you know what it's okay. It's okay. I'm i I'm good with myself and with other people. So I gave our class and at the end this guy said to me, Rabbi, how do you know it's okay? And I said to him, You are absolutely right. It's actually not okay. It's wonderful. I'm just trying to get you to okay. <laughs> and from okay, then we can start working on how wonderful and special and sweet and conscious life is meant to be. Right. People have completely forgotten that. No wow. one's living with sweetness. And so my message to mankind is chill out. Do you know the word Baruch is the only word where every letter in the gematria doubles the previous letter. So wow. the word Beis, Beis is a two, which doubles one, and the Kaf, the half is, is a 20, which doubles 10, and the resh is a 200, which doubles 100. There's no other letters in the Hebrew alphabet that double the previous letter. So when we say baruch, what we're doing is we're saying, God, you're doubling, you're, you're just giving increasing to us. God increasing, increasing, wow. expounding the world by doubling the world. The exponential growth is what you're doing. When, you, when we say a blessing, we're, exp you're exp we're expanding the world, doubling the world. It's the only letters, the only, the only three letters in the Hebrew alphabet that double. Mm. So That's we need difficult. to say it consciously then. Yeah. So that, which is really funny because right. the other word that comes from that is also um, Bechor, which is the firstborn. Mm. You know, the firstborn gets double the amount of inheritance in the, in the family mm. versus the other kids. So the word Bechor is also the doubling of the inheritance from a family. Yeah. Very cool. Wow. Well, thank you for joining us. Where can people find you and learn more from you and hear more of your ideas? We have well, a book, I think, I think the, is it, this is on Amazon, right? It is the old version. This is the revised edition, but okay. I think there are some old edition, which is basically very similar. Yeah. Um, this is almost every Jewish bookstore. It should be. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's sold out, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I run a two-month Jewish, authentic Jewish mindfulness course on Zoom. Okay. It's very, very 
very, very sweet and loving and self-compassionate and nurturing. Who's it for? For anyone. Really for anyone. All backgrounds, religious, not religious, men, women, everyone. And, it's and how do they find us? LitMindfulness.org. L-I-T stands for living in tune. Mm -hmm. LitMindfulness.org. And we'll put all the links in the description. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, I, I used to have about 300 classes on SoundCloud, but they got taken down. I'm trying to move them across into Spotify and YouTube, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to sit in front of a computer to do that. So if you can find someone who's willing to do that for me. Yeah. Okay, that goes yeah. for the listeners. Anybody and, 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 and you're here too. In yeah. person, come to Aish in Jerusalem, the center of the world. And who's and that for? That's for everyone yeah. as well. Anyone who wants to come and find out what it means to be a Jew, Jewish identity, how to respect everyone, how to... To, to be part of the Jewish family. Yeah, and this is men and women. Men, women, boys, girl, old, young, everyone. Yeah, there's a little bit of a bonus. If you come to Ish, you'll also get to see us here. Yeah, so it's the it's best. It's a pretty good place. And the, the Western the Wall is right behind the windows over here. Yeah. Right. We'd love to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We'd love to have you again. There's just like so much more we can talk about. Base is the same. All right. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching the Fish and Coat Show. If you like what you just watched, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment with any ideas you'd like to see on any future episodes. We'll see you next time.